On this week's episode, we are traveling to Kuwait in the core worlds, not Balmora, like I said last week, where we will discuss the importance of the shipbuilding industry amidst constant galactic warfare, and uh, how I could try to make a Lord of the Rings reference out of almost anything. Keyword being try. <laughs> On with the show. Hello there everyone and welcome back to Lady Kira's Galactic Adventure, where we traverse the universe in our Corellian Corvette Cruiser, The Vindicator. I am of course your host on this excursion, Admiral Kira Vandari of the Alliance to Restore the Republic. This time we are continuing our exploration of the interior as we travel to the planet, Kuat. If you have no questions, comments, or concerns, then make sure to remember that the length of Ahsoka's mandrels is not equal to the importance or validity of her on-screen adaptation, that the Bad Batch looks Looking physically whiter than the rest of the clone army is problematic as hell, and people of color playing characters in the Star Wars universe like Ahmed Best deserve respect, more appreciation, and an apology this Black History Month. This week on Lady Kira's Galactic Adventure. If you are an avid listener and or a watcher of the show, you know that we first start with the unclear Disney canon and then move on from there. So let's get right into this. In canon, the planet Kuat was located in the Kuat system, to which we have no conclusive canon information on, at M10 in the galactic grid. We will have system time later though, so hold on to your butts until then. It was a terrestrial planet most well known for its vital shipbuilding industry run by Kuat Drive Yards, the KDY, as I will I'll be referring to them as the KDY for the rest of the video because your girl's got to abbreviate somehow, okay? The KDY is a starship manufacturer which would produce some of the Empire's most dangerous ships such as Imperial class Star Destroyers, Walkers, Juggernauts, Command Cruisers, and Dreadnoughts. Fun. This company may be most well known for the super weapons it designed for the Empire but it also did design ships for the Galactic Republic. Like some other industrial worlds we have covered, like Vulpter in the Deep Core, a giant man-made ring lies about the equator of the planet, where the ships themselves were made. Citizens of this planet describe the ring as, quote, a scaffold in space, bridged and augmented with enormous habitats and machinery. Inside the scaffolding existed the skeletons of ships and other craft, end quote. Due to the economic importance of this planet, it was heavily equipped to defend itself, with a ground to garrison, a space-based fleet that is known to be virtually impenetrable, and to that I say, King Theoden of Rohan once believed Helm's Deep to be impenetrable, and he turned out to be very, very wrong. But when an army of over a million modified orcs comes to your door with a Grand, then we'll see how strong your defenses really are. Also, in a weird way, the Death Star is kind of the Empire's version of Grand. Anyway, tokenisms aside, it's time for everyone's favorite segment and my personal favorite part of the show, it's history time. We don't have an early history of this planet, and our canon knowledge of it only goes as far back as the Clone Wars period, which isn't very far at all. Transgressions aside, many Republic ships, including peacekeeping and diplomatic vessels, were made here and got pumped up on their Jawa juice during this tiny little conflict you may have heard of called, like, I don't know, the Clone Wars. During that time, the KDY started producing starships such as the very well-known Venerator-class Star Cruiser, also known as Jedi Cruisers. Moving on from the Clone Wars into the birth of the Empire, Kuat became the one-stop shop for Imperial warships. For not only were they built here, they were repaired and resupplied here like some kind of Imperial-only general store slash car wash. Don't ask me why. Due to this planetary ring housing multitudes of ships, the Empire highly favored it, in fact making Kuat a major part of their military strategies. After the destruction of Grand 2.0, which you might know as the Death Star, the Rebellion began a bombing campaign hoping to take out major shipbuilding factories across Imperially controlled space, but I guess they weren't as bold or as powerful as Saruman as they made little to no impact on Kuat's industry. Maybe I will give them the Isengard stamp of approval. Wow. But even then, Isengard didn't get the Isengard stamp of approval. 
After the Battle of Hoth, <laughs> Kuat became a major part of the Rebellion's Operation Ringbreaker, an attempt to mobilize against major shipyards and blow them to smithereens. This is ultimately a failure, though, further cementing its impenetrable status. And that's pretty much everything I have in canon, so it's time to pop on those Legends lenses so we can mosey on over to the other side and learn a bit more about this place. Too much? Probably. Before we cover the planet itself, it is time for everyone's second most favorite segment. It's system time, baby. It's system time. The Kuat system is a sixth planet star system, all in orbit around one sun, Kuat. Yes, I know that's confusing. I didn't make the name, sorry. In the first orbital position, we have the planet Ristel, a searing rock with no moons slash Daryls. In the second orbital position, we have Gorvas, a volcanic rock with one Daryl. And no, I'm not elaborating on the bit. Go catch up on episodes. <laughs> Next, we have Dover Kuat, also confusing, I know, a temperate terrestrial world with two moons slash Daryls. And in the fourth orbital position, we have Kuat, which we will cover when we have covered everything not as cool as it. So in the fifth orbital position, we have Gordis, a barren rock with three Daryls. Finally, in the sixth orbital position, we have Rasapan, a gas giant with a whopping 22 moons. Not enough to break our record, but pretty close. With the rest of the system over and done with, let's head back to the fourth orbital position and finish off the main attraction. Actually, for the first time in a long time, it's moon time? No cool intro though, I'm sorry, but Kuat does have two of them. First, we have Badur, which for some reason is the headquarters of two mob bosses. It's a weird B-plot, but um, I'll allow it, I guess. A Mandalorian also killed one of those mob bosses, furthering the B-plot, which I also will allow. Onto the second and final moon of moon time, we have Rone, to which all I know about it is that it had facilities for quote, testing drives. I'm unsure whether those are hyper drives or something spice related or something else entirely. Anyways, moon time is now over, so let's move on. <laughs> Kuat has a rotation period of 20 standard hours and an orbital period of 322 local days. The standard hours, of course, referring to the Coruscant Cycle, which is the standard for timekeeping in the galaxy. As I already mentioned, Kuat is a terrestrial planet, but it also has a Type 1 breathable atmosphere, a temperate climate, standard gravity, pretty, pretty basic for, for you know, terrestrial planets. The surface of Kuat had three continents and a multitude of islands covered in forests and plains. There is virtually no hostile life here, instead being populated by herbivores such as the Draven, which looked like furry Charizards without wings, which provided compost for gardening. We love a sustainable queen. Kuat also had an aristocratic government system, and besides its ships, um, it was known to export luxury goods like art, alcohol, and apparently I wrote art twice, so art again. <laughs> now it's time for our favorite segment, once again. It's history time, everyone. Actually, actually, wait. Um, before history time, let's let's talk about the Kuwaiti people. You know, like the citizens. They're kind of a major part of the story since they, um, you know, live here. Anyways, the galaxy views the Kuwaiti people as proud and class conscious, and they're mostly composed of humans, actually about 80% of Kuwaiti were, but that's pretty standard for planets of this kind. The total population of Kuwait consisted of 3.6 billion sentients. If one was to visit this planet, you must likely be staying among the hundreds of millions of workers that live in, you know, the shipbuilding ring and then traveling below to the surface. If you did not make it there, the permits needed to get there and were incredibly expensive. And if you wanted to leave the capital city, you're going to have to dish out a lot more cash. Credits. Credits. In fact, the police of this world were more likely than not inclined to deny anyone the access to the surface even if you had the money unless you were a citizen. Okay, now now, now it's every time, everyone's favorite time of the week, our favorite segment, dudes and dudettes, it's history time. <laughs> 
Luad was first settled in 27,500 BBY by settlers and sleeper ships, and before even the beginnings of the Republic, Kuat had established an aristocracy based on their shipbuilding industry and became a major political power by 2553 and the founding of the Galactic Republic, to which it was a founding member, and that is the longest run-on sentence I have ever spoken in my life. Me. Future me. Edit your scripts better. God. Actually, ten merchant families came to run Kuat and literally called themselves the Ten. I'm not, I'm not gonna say anything. You already know how I feel about uninspired Star Wars naming conventions. But the Ten's main goal was to, quote, <laughs> form the largest and most influential shipbuilding company in the galaxy, which is rather ambitious if I do say so myself, okay? They ended up hiring terraformers, ecologists, and animal breeders from everywhere to transform Kuat from a barren, rocky planet into the lush world we know it to be. During the Alsacon conflicts, which I am not getting into right now, so go check out my episode Alsacon has a lot of conflicts, where me and Aresti Nell go into the nitty gritty of the thousands of years of warfare between Alsacon and Coruscant and the reasons behind it. Kuat was located in Republic space during that time. Basically, the galaxy was divided across um, this section of space called the Slice. And if you were on one side of the Slice, you were Republic, and the other side, you were Al-Sakani. Not, not ethnically, like, politically. Just go listen to the episode. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have a YouTube video for that one. But anyways, I'm unsure how much Kuat itself aided in the war, but they were most likely building light cruisers for the Republic. Maybe even for Alsacon. But being a founding member of the Republic, Kuat making ships for the enemy, you know, might besmirk their image a bit. During the Sith Wars, though, Kuat was most definitely making ships for the Republic, as the Sith were very much not once members of it. Anyways, on to Clone Wars! <laughs> Kuat remained loyal to the Republic during the Clone Wars period, producing multiple types of star cruisers for their government, like we mentioned before, the Venerator-class cruisers, the walkers, we love the walkers that we see in Clone Wars, the uh, ATTEs, we love them. Love them. Due to its immense economic importance, Kuat heavily benefited from the war, with many members of the KDY winning favor with Chancellor Palpatine himself, which may be why they became, <laughs> which may be why I get it, uh, they became such an important part of the Empire's production and military. I'm really not funny. You're gonna find out how unfunny I am by the end of this episode, by the way. Cause God. <laughs> but onto the Empire. When the Empire was formed in 19 BBY, Kuat was one of the first worlds secured under it because Emperor Palpatine's plans of destruction required ships. Lots and lots and lots of ships. Which... Excuse me. Which will later apparently be secretly made on Exegol. Underneath the surface of the planet. That still confuses me. Anyways. <laughs> I've been saying anyways a lot on my- do not play a drinking game to this episode and drink every time I say anyways. <laughs> Just don't. I fear for your health. Anyways. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> the Imperial Bureau of Ships and Services restricted access to Kuat's orbital shipyards to basically just the Empire and its friends, but the Empire doesn't have friends, so just the Empire. These restrictions also caused those shipyards to be placed under military jurisdiction, but technically were still civilian owned. Probably for tax reasons, so that the Kuwati citizens would still have to pay taxes on it. Like, free will! <laughs> More like, huh. Not that! Moving on, anyways. <laughs> I'm not cutting any of this out, this is gonna be too funny. Like most megacorporations during the time of the Empire, the merchant houses on Kuat became annoyingly wealthy. And it makes sense, their engineers were literally building the lifeblood of the galaxy at that period of time, right? They even built a copy of the Super Star Destroyer Executor, aka Crispy Chicken Nugget Man's personal Star Destroyer, and if you don't speak my language, hi, um, Darth Vader. 
Yeah. They also built AT-ATs, among other kinds of walkers, which were pretty much standard for an imperial go-bag. Toothpaste, nutrient blocks, freshly pressed uniform, oh, and my expandable AT-AT walker. Imagine if Hank Pym existed in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> like, our, uh, our problems would increase exponentially. I tried to make a joke. Make a better one in the comments of this video, <laughs> or in a review on our show on Apple Podcasts. Please, I'm begging you. I think I need comedy lessons. Back to the militarization of Kawat, though. Imperial security it restricted the planet to the point where you could only get in three ways. One, by a passenger port, a shuttle, a freight port, which is a big, big shuttle, or an Imperial transfer post, the latter of which is just for Imperials and their friends, but Imperials don't have friends, so just Imperials. Is that catching on? I really don't think it is. I'm trying to make fetch happen. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> uh, hopping forward to the Battle of Endor, which I'm going to be referring to as the BOE at some point in, in this episode. At the same time as it, probably to distract the Empire as much as possible, the Alliance staged an attack to occupy the Quat shipyard so they couldn't supply more ships to the Empire on Endor. It was unsuccessful though, but I think that was kind of the point. After the BOB, the Empire, what was left of it, pumped up its security like that creepy incel guy in She-Hulk did with a totally not super soldier serum, okay? Actually, they were like... They were really only securing the shipyards because the millions of people living on the surface of the planet don't matter. Not to the Empire, at least. Love that for us. The, but a group of rebels on Kuat had rigged all of the shipyards to explode and actually beat the Alliance to it. General Han Solo happened to be in the area and helped clean up the Imperials in the sector after everything went boom as he does. The rebels that set those explosions, though, were not linked to the Alliance at all, and in fact kicked Alliance rebels off of the planet to try and take down the imps inside the KDY. All, all they wanted, all these rebels wanted, right, was this super epic Star Destroyer called the Eclipse. <laughs> but they ditched it because it's too flashy and would have given them away instantly if they did any chaos magic stuff with it. <laughs> So, help, I think you can understand that, you know, there were still Imperials on Kuat after this. If the people who were going to fight those Imperials didn't take the ship that they would need to fight them. In 780Y, there was a standoff between loyal Imperials on Kuat and the New Republic called the Battle of Kuat. I know. <laughs> But you have to remember, Kuat's planetary defenses were better than Isengard, which is irrelevant because Isengard was destroyed by walking and talking trees. Shout out to my boys, the Ents, because they lost the Ent wives, but you know what I mean, okay? <laughs> Although the New Republic had managed to push Kuat's forces back onto the planet and stop its big boys from leaving the shipyards, Kuat would remain an Imperial Fortress world until 8 BBY one year later, when Imperial defenses left for the new territories in the Outer Rim and made Kuat rely on itself and only itself, because Kuat, being Imperial and all, did not have friends. Like, just like the Empire, you know? It's not catching on. <laughs> it's not. But since they were defenseless, com comparatively, of course, because they still had ships to defend themselves, the New Republic was actually able to capture the planet due to a scheme between a member of the KDY, Rald Rymovonik, another person I don't know, and my favorite of all time, which I'm- Oh my god. And my favorite of all time, Wedge Antilles. I love you, Wedge, you conniving little minx. He deserves a big hug for this one, though. This Mavunik had the majority of the shares in the KDY at this point in time. So if he was able to convince, well, he had the most shares in the company, he could pretty much do anything. So he convinced the entire company to get to, to, to what's it called? Surrender. That's the word I'm looking for. To surrender to the New Republic. And of course, there were citizens who were unhappy with this. Mostly the engineers, the head engineers. So they actually fled to the deep core. I'm guessing to BIS. Go check out episode one, the BIS hyperspace track, where we talk about 
Emperor Palpatine's secret clone facilities on Biss, where he might have been making Snoke's. Just go, go, go listen to it. It's really bad. It's my least favorite out of the ones I've done. It was the first. Give me, give me some slack. But by the time uh, the New Republic officially acquired Kuwait, they cumul cumulatively, cumul cumulatively <laughs> controlled three fourths of the settled galaxy, and most importantly, were granted access to their shipyards. But to uphold these relations, they actually held two embassies in Kuwait space: one on the ground of the planet, and one in the orbital ring around it. Very smart. The access to Kuat and its engineers would prove vital in the coming year's Thrawn campaign, which I've only started reading the first book in the original trilogy, and when I read all three, I'll do an official Thrawn video, because he's my favorite bad guy in the history of everything. And the later Yuzon Vong War. For more information on the Yuzon Vong themselves and why they started a war, go check out my episode entitled, quote, The Yuzon Gone. I couldn't come up with a good enough pun for it, but they are legitimately fascinating. <laughs> Kuat was actually able to hold out for a long time during the war, surprisingly, supplying ships, obviously, to the New Republic, and hosting war rooms on their planet, but they would eventually fall to the Yuzon Vong. Their refugees not returning until the war was over. There was also some stuff that happened here during the Second Galactic Civil War, but that's still gonna need its own episode, cause tis dense. We should bring back tis into our normal lingo. It makes you feel much more important than you are. It's like a nice little confidence boost every time you say it and on that note we're done here and that is everything i have for you on kuat and canon and legends i hope you enjoyed your journey this week and your stay so far aboard the vindicator if you have any questions comments or concerns about your stay feel free to bring it up with one of our personnel on board via a private message or dm perhaps on our tiktok accounts at shadow collective rules or at Unidentified Robot, or maybe our Instagram at Lady Kira, or perhaps with a review of our show. Or like, subscribe. Make sure you lick that subscribe button like Jar Jar Banks licked Qui Gon Jinn's hand. Uh, but if you want more of me, I don't know why you would, but you can head over to patreon.com slash productions and for only five bucks a month, you can have access to tons of additional content, including early episodes, one to two days early, depending on the depresso of the week, uh, and our exclusive Discord community. All of those usernames and their respective platforms will be listed in the show notes. Next time, we will be journeying to Commonor of Commonor Run Infamy and whatever core worlds I can cover in an hour or less. Until next time, my friends, companions, and droids, may the Force be with you all. And for any of you wondering if this is actually me, hi, this is actually me. I've been off my allergy medication and there's been sickness in my house. Um, when I, so I made the collective decision to channel my inner Sophia Nygaard and embrace the American accent. Because I do live in America. I'm so tired. Goodbye. <laughs>